His love never fails. And because of His love, we can produce and we should produce fruits in our lives. And His power is limitless. And we will dig into the term fruitfulness in order to understand what is it. And we will see how Jesus reacted when the situation was unfruitful, when by some reasons he faced the tree. You know this story from the Gospel. And this tree was leafy. It was beautiful by the appearance from the distance. But it was fruitless. There was no outcome from this tree, which was helpful for humans. So be fruitful. Oh, but let's first pray. Father God, we just lift up your holy name and we ask you, please help us to grasp the truth of your word. Please help us to understand what you want to say to us. And please help us to be open for your amazing power to reshape, remold, recreate us in order to be your instruments and to bring fruit of the Spirit in your kingdom, which is so needed for many and many human souls in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, fruitfulness. Definition. First of all, I want to say that fruitfulness based on a fact. Fruitfulness based on a reality. And in both cases, it produces something. It produces something. It could be a good result. Like the fact that something produces good result or somebody produces good result. Also, it could be a lot of fruit. The fact that plants produce a lot of fruit. So, good result and a lot of fruits could be a good, clear sign of fruitfulness. And actually, the term fruitfulness is very important to understand what God meant when he placed in his word three symbols. All those three symbols are connected with trees. First one is a vine. It speaks about Israel's spiritual privileges. As a part of this vine, we also gained those spiritual privileges which belonged to Israel previously. And we are members of the house of Israel if we believe that God is our God, He is our Savior, He is our provider. Another symbol is fig tree. Fig tree is a symbol of Israel's national privileges. When we speak about nation, nationality or nation, we speak basically about huge group of people who are combined by their style of living, by many specifics of ethnical differences. And God invited us, Jesus invited us to become a member of his family, to become a member of his nation, nation of God's people or nation of God's children. And another symbol is the olive tree. It is a symbol of Israel's religious privileges. God has called us to be a nation of priests, a nation of his ministers, a nation of the branches which produce fruit of the Spirit. And all, all those three trees, as I said, stand for the fruitfulness of the land of Israel. It is a promised land. And actually in our story today we will talk about early fruits and late fruits. There are two groups of fruits. Fruits from the previous season and fruits from the current season or coming season. We should keep in mind that those two groups fruits the tree, which we will see in our example, produces in a certain time, in a certain season. Without that, we wouldn't understand words of the Gospel. But before, I wanted to bring to you a global picture, which we take from the book of Revelation, chapter 6, and it is about cosmic disturbances which are coming into this world eventually. From book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 12 and 14, we see this picture which John brought to us. I looked when he, the Lamb of God, opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Several prophets speak about earthquake. They would be huge earthquake, and all human structures, systems, will be overthrown, turned upside down, demolished, ruined. 
God will do that in order to reestablish his kingdom. You cannot build anything until something which was previous will be wiped off. You cannot build anything good on ancient, not good foundation. Before building something new, you have to level the ground. Like in, in our area, which we pass almost every day in Kokwitlam, this part of the street, Linton Street, is not presentable. A lot of trees, I'm not against the trees, but when there are many trees, they, you know, close the sun light and it's very dark. And because of that, there is a lot of mold and other fauna has been developed in this area. And time came for the new house to be built. So when builders came, first what they've done, they demolished, they wiped off what was built previously. They leveled the ground now. Next step would be bringing materials and then building a new house. So what we read here, when he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. As I said to you, there are two types of fruits, early and late fruits. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. I think including Vancouver Island. If it says every island, it means that Vancouver Island is included. And please keep that in mind, verse 14, when Jesus would say in the Gospel, if you would say to that mount, move and go into the sea, it will be as you believe. So he, I think, mentioned uh, when he said to his disciples, it wasn't only about a prayer, it was also about future events which will come into reality or existence. Now, warning about the fruitlessness, absence of fruits. The fig tree is a fit emblem of the house of Israel. Its peculiarity is that the blossoms of the fruit appear before the leaves. In a fig tree case, fruits come before leaves, which is abnormal, but that's reality. Natural, therefore, we should look for fruit on a tree in full leaf. This accounts for why Jesus cursed the fig tree that had on it nothing but leaves, Matthew chapter 21. The presence of the leaves led him to expect fruit. And I'm sure he knew that there are no fruits on this tree, but it's more was object lesson for his disciples who followed him. And when he found none, he cursed the tree for its fruitlessness. Mark gives us another version of the incident, Mark 11. He says that Jesus found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet. And what Mark speaks about, he speaks about late fruits. Time for the late fruits didn't come yet. Why then curse the tree? This is easily explained. The early fruit or blossoms appear <coughs> in spring. So when God calls us to him, he expects early fruits, before we will become leafy, before we will become religious, before we will become religiously educated, he expects from us early fruits or first fruits. And as it, it is written here, they appear in spring before the leaves open on branches of the last year's growth. And the first ripe fruit is ready in June or earlier even. The late figs grow on the new wood, keep appearing during the season, are ripe from August onward. The unripe fruit of autumn often survives the winter and ripens when vegetation revives in the spring. Now it was about the 1st of April when Jesus cursed the fig tree, and the time of figs was not yet because they didn't ripen before June. But fig trees which have retained their leaves through the winter usually have some of the last year's figs also. And as April was too early for new leaves or fruit, Jesus knowing this and seeing leaves on the tree naturally expected to find some of the last year fruits. And when he found none, he cursed the tree because of its deceptive character. So what is deception? Deception when we 
are religious wood in appearance, but somewhere deep inside we have different face. It is called also hypocrisy, when we have two masks, one mask for our home ones, another mask for public appearance. And of course Jesus hates that, he doesn't like this. It is called deceptive character. The application of this incident to the house of Israel is simple. Actually, I wouldn't say it's only to the house of Israel, I disagree with that. It is also applicable to the church today. Naturally, Jesus from their leafy profession would expect to find fruit on the tree of their religious and social lives. And when he found none, he rebuked them for their hypocrisy. So Mark 11, our main story, my house shall be called house of prayer. You probably noticed that the message about fruits, message about fruitfulness is connected with the prayer. It requires a lot of prayer for us to be changed, to be transformed, but God is in control. And also what is interesting, we see here a conflict, a clash between Holy One of Israel and religious system. It was a conflict between Holy One of Israel when he visited Jerusalem and religious system which was corrupted. I'm sure if Jesus will come today, he will overthrow many other elements of religious systems in this world because it is also corrupted. Starting with verse 11, Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple when he had looked around at all things. And I'm sure he had seen all kind disturbances or all kind perversions which were in Jerusalem at this time, but our was already late. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He, I'm sure, recognized everything what should be turned upside down or ruined or wiped off before new beginning will come. But he also was he was loving God, he is loving God, and he knew that his disciples should have rest. And they went to Bethany. Bethany in itself is a very interesting village. It's not too far from Jerusalem, approximately 2.5 kilometers of walking distance. But what is interesting in Bethany, Bethany has double meaning. Double meaning. First translation of Bethany means house of dates. I love dates. Dates are one of most nutritious fruits. But same name, Bethany, can be translated as the house of misery. House of misery. So when we speak about fruits, we can produce fruits or we can produce a misery. We can cause a misery to dwell in us and we can spread misery around us, which is poisonous fruit. Or we can be as a house of dates where we will produce fruits which will be nutritious and beneficial for many people around us. It depends from our inner state of heart, mind and soul. It depends of our inner commitment to who God is because God is a great gardener. He is producer and He is able to nourish us and help us to produce other fruits. So he, I'm sure he went purposely to Bethany because his disciples, they were very skilled in Hebrew. They knew this play of words game. How you call this game when you play with words? Scrabble. 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 It was never ending Scrabble. When disciples followed Jesus, it was never ending Scrabble. He played with the names of villages. He visited specific villages with specific purposes. He let them sleep in Bethany. Think about that. And then next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. We see that he is, we see his human nature here. He was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. Again, Jesus knew everything what was around him and far away from him, right? He has had perfect knowledge. But why then he went to the tree which was leafy with his disciples? I already told you that. He wanted to show something to his disciples after sleeping, spending night in Bethany. When he came to eat, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And when, when readers normally read this part of the verse, they are confused. If it is not season for figs, why then 
he expected fruits and we already know with you that is why I spent approximately five minutes of reading this text so he wanted to show his disciples that if tree has leaves it should be having fruits from previous season everybody who is skilled religiously in the social realm everybody who is talented as a human being he's supposed to be fruitful that's what kind of message we see here. Everybody who is leafy has to be fruitful. In response, Jesus said to it, It is terrible, it is terrible. Word of God from the mouth of Jesus, which is supposed to be bring life, which is supposed to be bring new beginning, shut down life of a tree, starting from the roots. We see loving, compassionate Jesus. We see mighty creator who created this tree. When he saw this leafy state of this tree in absence of fruit, word of mouth went toward this part of creation and shut down the life in it. And what he said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Absolutely important message. God visits us time by time by time by time. And he, if he has no food of our fruitfulness, we lose opportunity to feed even ourselves. We're becoming a tool of self-destruction. When God wants to use us and we do not allow him to do that, we basically destroy ourselves. And his disciples heard it. They always followed him and they heard his words. So after this object lesson with a tree, he came to Jerusalem. Same situation. Beautiful Jerusalem. City of divine peace city of divine comfort and prosperity but what he faced in this city total corruption total chase for money 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 power influence and money it is a message of the danger when we just chasing money and prosperity so he entered jerusalem he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple so traders, merchants, instead of priests, those who have been trained, those who have been leafy, became merchants. In appearance they had religious mask, but inside they were traders for their own gain. And he turned upside down the system that was first earthquake. Do you remember we read in the book of Revelation about global earthquake? This one was local earthquake and it was started by Jesus himself physically. And overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He's not only overturned the tables of the money changers, he's also turned upside down the seats who sold sacrifices. Doves were part of the sacrificial system. He basically broke even sacrificial system. Why? Because of corruption. In verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. He reminded them that in the previous season, in the season of Torah, in the season of Holy Scriptures, it was prohibited to do business during days of worship, during seasons of worship. In verse 17, we read, then he taught, then he taught. Do you see what is going on here? First, he demolished, overturned, ruined, and wiped off previous corrupted system. And then he started his teaching. Why? Because if, if he would start his teaching right from the beginning, it wouldn't work. You remember I told you, like in Coquitlam, when you build new house, you should, it's not only in Coquitlam, everywhere, you should level first, you should level first ground, so he'll basically level the ground first, before laying his word 
of teaching. Also, what is interesting in verse 17, we read, he taught saying, but he started his teaching by doing something. We can teach by the words and we can teach by our actions. He started with actions. So when, he, when Jesus faces corruption, he starts with actions. And what way he started, in what way he started his teaching? He started his teaching with reminding them about words from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 56, verse 7. Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? Again, maybe for you it doesn't mean much, but for people of those days in Jerusalem it meant much, because he said, Is it not written, which means, Is it not a logos, which you consider as a holy word of God? Is it not the holy word of God which is written, which you claim as your foundation for your lives, but in reality your actions you know, go against of the written word? And then he says, my house. What he says to them, it is not your house, it is not your you know, ground for making money and prosperity for yourself. It is still my house. And you came to this house. You do not own this house. I own this house. So follow my rules. I am the owner of this house, not you, leafy people. My house shall be called, which means you have to call it. You have to proclaim this message of the house of prayer. It is your business in my house. That's what Jesus says. I invited you to my house to call, to proclaim, to preach about a prayer. But instead you proclaim, you preach about business of making money and getting prosperity. But you have made it a den of thieves. What he says here instead of the elevation, and it was on a holy mountain. So Jerusalem is, is situated on a holy mountain, mountain of mountains, Mount Sign. But instead they created a ditch. They created a bottomless pit of destruction already by their own choices and actions. And the scribes and chief priests heard it. Again, they heard. Everyone heard what Jesus said. And sought how they might destroy him. Do you see their perverted reaction on his message? Instead of repenting, they sought how they can kill him, destroy him. Do you see what produces in the minds and hearts of perverted people? For those perverted people, prosperity is their God. Money is their God. So instead of receiving the message of God, they see how to destroy someone who produces the words of life. And so how they might destroy him, for they feared him. They didn't have love in their hearts. They feared him. There are two different fears. There is a fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, but they feared him by the animal fear. To lose, to lose what they planned to do, to lose the grip of control and power. For they feared him. What was the root of their fear also? The root of their fear was the reaction of people on Jesus teaching. Jesus' teaching produced very interesting reaction in people. It is called English word astonishment or astonished, which means, I come close to the screen because it's very small. It means to strike one out of self-possession. It is a matter of possession. God's teaching, God's word is a matter of of possession. He is not accidentally said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. What he said to hypocrites, businessmen in the temple, he said that you fear me because people around who hear me, they lose their self-possession. Basically they lose themselves. And in order, why? Why they lose themselves? Because word of God wants to reshape, remold, recreate them. So what God does with his word, 
he causes people to lose them control over their lives, to lose themselves, and then to be ready for his involvement. It's like his word demolishes, ruins, wipes off old infrastructure in us, and we lose control of it, and then it comes and reshapes, remolds, and rebuilds something new. When evening had come, he went out of the city. He has done his mission. His mission was accomplished. I forgot to tell you, the astonishment also causes people to drive away. To drive away from human control. God's word causes us to be driven away from being controlled by humans. It is not possible to control someone who is under influence of divine God's teaching because God's teaching makes us free. Yeah. Recreates. Thank you. I understood. <laughs> we continue this story. Mark 11, chapter 11, verses 20 through 24. It is already a lesson of the withered fig tree. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Do you see what is going on here? In the morning, death of something caused the beginning in somebody's life again. Something died in order for other people to gain the lesson. Jesus himself eventually in this story will die in order for us to gain something. So when they saw the fig tree dried up from what? From what? Why it says here that fig tree was dried up from the roots? That's where it started. Right. Excellent. God showed that it was started from the roots. Roots were poisonous. Roots were poisonous. God created the only holy, precious roots of His Word in the Bible, starting from the beginning. Never call this part of the Bible old. Because when you call God's Word old, you saying to Him, you are old man. Very old man. God doesn't like when we call him old man. He is younger than we all are together. He is eternal. His word never been old and never would be old. Verse 21. And Peter, I like Peter. Peter always the first one. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, remembering is a very important word. We have to remember what has happened in the past in order to understand what is going on now. Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. It looks like Jesus wasn't able to see the tree which he cursed withered away. Of course he was able to see. So Jesus answered and said to him, have faith in God. Do you know that even Jesus' mom thought that he was crazy? Why? This is a very clear example. Peter says to him, look, Rabbi, tree which you cursed and withered away. And Jesus even do not respond to his childish, stupid question. Instead of that, he says, have faith in God. And actually, in verse 22, he didn't answer Peter. He answered to all of them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever or who... In Greek language, says to this mountain, which is Temple Mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Just for your, for your information, you probably notice sometimes Jesus says, Omein, Omein, or assuredly, assuredly, as English translators put, which is not the same. Omein, Omein, but in this case he said just once, assuredly I say to you. You know why? Because he has not yet died. Assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, and I just read the whole verse already to you. So my question to you, you probably heard many sermons when preachers based 
fruitfulness of prayer, power of prayer on this verse, right? I've, I've heard those sermons that according to Jesus' words in verse 23, we can pray and believe and it will be done according to our belief. But it's not what he is saying here. He speaks about himself here. He doesn't speak here about us. You can try. You can go to the mountains and command mountains to go into the sea and check if your prayer is powerful enough. But in this case, time will come. That's what he says. Time will come when I command and all mountains which I will command will jump into the sea. Because it would be huge global earthquake which we read in the book of Revelation. Therefore, I say to you, which means to us, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Be careful. It's not about everything what we want and wherever we want, whenever we want. It should be in tune with God's plan. It should be in tune with God's will. It should be in tune with God's time. Right? Do you agree with me? Thank you. And now a hymn of faith, famous hymn of faith, Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 17 and 19, also connected with a fig tree. Fig tree is very important, starting with verse 17. First, it's Habakkuk draws to us a picture of luck of many things, or, or a time of destruction, time of, time of God's judgment, actually, time of, of God's visitation. He says, Thou the fig tree may not blossom, which means all religiosity will be vanished or empty, nor fruit be on the vines, which means all our privileges will be empty and pointless. Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, very heavy picture of God's judgment or God's visitation. The last line, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, speaks about organizational structures, about organizations. Fold from the dictionary means organization cease operating as a result of financial problems or a lack of support. So what Habakkuk says, time will come when organization will lack of financial support and there would be many problems, but do not worry about that. Just have faith in God. In verse 18 we read, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And He will make me walk on my high heels. Please note that Habakkuk says every time, My salvation, my strength, my feet will make me on my high heels. He stresses here personal relationship with God. All structures, as I said, will be demolished. But personal relationship with God will not only survive, but also will be an establishing force, establishing strength, strength for us. It would be great encouragement. And last slide, just about another tree. This tree is also leafy, but this tree has the fruit, not fruits, the fruit of the Spirit, which we can take from the book of Galatians, chapter 5. And if you remember a little bit history of Galatians, Galatians had tendency to slide into the work, into the labor. They abandoned their faith, their belief, their trust, and decided to make themselves better by their own efforts. But what God reminds us that the fruit of the Spirit comes from Him, from His Spirit. And we know that love joy, goodness, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we, in tight connection with the Spirit of Holy One, He is able to equip us with those parts of His fruit. Amen? And then, when we 
produce that kind of fruit, we always allow God to come and use us, to come and feed himself by what we produce. And then by doing that, we bless people around us, we nourish them. Amen? Amen. May God bless you when Jesus will come and visit you. Please be available to him. Please give him whatever he requires of you. Father God, I just pray that you mercifully allow us to be nourished by you in a level of becoming fruitful. Even when we experience this pain or some kind of losses during this, the phase of destruction or demolishing or just leveling up the volumes of our souls and minds and hearts, please remind us that we are under your close supervision, under your loving care and help us to be patient enough until you will recreate, reshape, remold us and place your own structure, your own values, your own strength in us in order for us to be fruitful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.